Hello and welcome back to another Macbeth revision video. Now, when revising this play and especially its main characters, Banco is certainly one of the main characters you can definitely anticipate a question coming up relating to either him or his relationship with Macbeth. He's a very important character because Shakespeare uses him as a contrast and as a foil to Macbeth. Both of them get prophecies from the witches. However, Macbeth develops ambition. However, Banquo still accepts his position on the social hierarchy. He doesn't decide to do anything against the king. He doesn't let these prophecies change the way he sees himself and his, he doesn't change and affect his respect for divine right of kings okay so Banquo's approach is actually used by Shakespeare to illustrate to his audience this is how Macbeth should have acted this is what Macbeth should have done okay however because Banquo trusted Macbeth too much he trusted the appearance of Macbeth being still his friend even after he became king too much Macbeth ultimately ended up betraying and having him killed. However, Banquo is still an important character and a very essential character that you need to be aware of. Therefore, if you forget everything about Banquo's character, these are the five quotations behind me that I will suggest memorizing if you're writing about him and I will show you how to tie it into structure and language analysis as well as context and theme points you can make for each of the quotes. The first quotation, which you can use to talk about Banquo's character, is after he receives the witch's prophecies, okay? So the witches hail Macbeth, Thane of Cordon King hereafter, and then they turn to Banquo and say, you're not gonna be king, but your children will be. Then the first prophecy of the witches that Macbeth is gonna be Thane of Cordor comes true. And Banquo says, can the devil speak true? And this is a rhetorical question that he utters in Act 1, Scene 3. So here we can see that Banquo, just like Macbeth, is shocked. Oh my gosh, what the witch has prophesied is true. However, he speaks using this metaphor and of course he asks this rhetorical question, illustrating that he still distrusts the witch's uh, motives in revealing these prophecies. We can still see that he thinks that even if they've said a little bit of truth, he doesn't trust their intent. This is in contrast to Macbeth, who already the seeds of ambition are planted in the witches' minds, and he's a little bit misguided into thinking that maybe the witches are doing this for his own good. What theme that you can tie this into directly is the theme of the supernatural. We can see, of course, that the supernatural within the play are agents of chaos. The witches, the apparitions, all of these are used to uh, warn Shakespeare's audience that you should never and you must never trust the witches. And of course, we can see that Banquo definitely does not trust the witches. Contextually, he reflects the Jacobean distrust of witches, okay? Most Jacobeans were very suspicious and they were also very superstitious. And they definitely didn't trust the witches. So Banquo's approach in not trusting the witches, even if one of the prophecies came true, would have been seen really favorably by the Jacobean viewers of Shakespeare's play. The second quotation, which illustrates once more that Banquo, he takes the correct approach. This is how you should treat the witches is he says, and he tells Macbeth, hey, 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 slow down, slow down. Be careful. The instruments of darkness tell us truth. This is in act one, scene three. He basically tells Macbeth, yeah, okay. I can see that you're kind of, you know, moved by this prediction and the prophecy and one of them has already come true because you're Thane of Cordor. But be careful because he says, using this metaphor, the witches who are instruments of darkness, who are instruments of evil, they will tell us truths a little bit to gain our trust, but then misguide us. And of course, he emphasizes this also through using alliteration. Once more, Banquo illustrates the approach that Macbeth should have had. However, Macbeth made a mistake in believing the witches and thinking that the witches are telling him all of these prophecies for his own good. Now, what you want to tie it to thematically is obviously the supernatural because the we can see that Banquo strongly and staunchly believes that the supernatural are terrible agents of chaos, but equally, the theme of reality and appearances. We can see here actually, Banquo does not trust the appearance of the witches. When he sees the witches and they're just saying, oh hell, Macbeth, Banquo, your children will be kings. He doesn't trust the appearance of just being honest and upfront. He knows that the reality that belies the witches is that they are agents of chaos. They are people who have been sent, or rather supernatural characters, who have been sent to cause some kind of strife, some, uh, some kind of chaos in Scotland now that peace has resumed. Now, what you want to tie this to again is this illustrates Banquo, uh, just like Jacobeans, 
At the time, contextually, Banquo was very super, uh, was very superstitious. And of course, this is also a time of the witch hunts, okay? So lots of women were being unveiled as being witches. And of course, what this is illustrating is this very strong belief that Banquo has that witches are always up to no good. The third quotation to uh, to talk about when you're considering Banquo's character and to memorize is when he discusses, this is when he is standing on watch. King Duncan is at Macbeth's castle. Uh, it's night time. And Banquo, whilst he's standing out guarding and patrolling and he sees Macbeth passing and entering his castle, he says to Macbeth, oh, this is weird. This weather is so weird. In heaven, the candles are all out. And this is taken from Act 2, Scene 1. We can see that Banquo starts to recognize weird, strange, supernatural elements are happening. The sky isn't, you know, um, the nighttime sky. We're not seeing that many stars in the sky. Something weird is happening. And of course, this fore foreshadows that something strange against God will be happening, which is the, king, the death of King Duncan. Now, what you want to talk about here is obviously the use of hyperbole, where we can see that Banquo recognizes something is off something is strange and something is amiss and this obviously ties into the theme of the supernatural because Macbeth is about to turn the natural order upside down by killing the king and letting the witches reign and all these terrible supernatural things happen. Now, this illustrates the, in contextually, divine right of kings, okay? When divine right is violated, when the person who God has chosen directly to be king is murdered, God becomes angry, he withdraws and chaos resumes, okay? So we can see that chaos is already starting because Macbeth is on his way to kill the king, okay? So this is what you can tie into contextually. The fourth quotation that you, I would suggest memorizing for Banquo's character is once he discovers the dead body of King Duncan, okay? So when there's a massive uproar and everybody discovers that King Duncan has died but nobody is sure who killed them, okay? He says, in the great hand of God, ellipsis, I fight of treasonous malice, okay? Treason is a special crime of uh, killing the king or queen. So here we can see that Banquo is completely outraged. He cannot believe what he's seeing, which is King Duncan's dead body. He just, he, he is so disgusted, he's extremely outraged. Massive contrast to Macbeth, who's the one that did the killing, right? So we can see here, Banquo is uncorrupt. He's not corrupted, whilst Macbeth is completely corrupted. And that's how he even ended up killing the king. And this declarative sentence illustrates that. Of course, what this uh, ties into in terms of theme is the theme of ambition, the corrupting influence of ambition. We can see Banquo, he is the perfect man in the sense that he never develops ambition. And this is something that makes him a very admirable character in our eyes as the audience. Now, what you want to tie this to contextually is, is that he is horrified that divine right of kings has been violated. He's rightfully horrified, as would many Jacobeans be horrified, okay? So Banquo's horror and his disgust and just his um, shock at what he sees with King Duncan's dead body echoes how many Jacobeans would be like. The fifth and final quotation to tie into Banquo's character is when he starts having creeping doubts. Things happen so quickly. They met the witches and then suddenly King Duncan dies and then suddenly Macbeth is now king. And he wonders, I fear that place most foully for it. And here we've got alliteration of F in fairly, fair, foully for it. He echoes what the witches say in Act 1, uh, Scene 1, fair is foul and foul is fair. And here we can see that Banquo is starting to have just a little bit of doubt, okay? He's speaking in alliteration to show that he's wondering, has Macbeth got something to do with this? However, he doesn't act enough. He's not mistrusting enough because Macbeth ends up having him murdered. The themes that these relate to is firstly ambition, because we can see here Banquo is shocked at the, uh, at the possibility that Macbeth has developed enough ambition to kill the king, but also reality and appearances, because we can see that Banquo is starting to question appearances. He's starting to question. Macbeth seems sad on the surface that King Duncan has died. His wife fainted. Yep, yeah, that's their appearances. But actually, is the reality a little bit different? Have they orchestrated this? Have they caused this, okay? So he's starting to wonder, but he doesn't act quick enough because that's what leads him to be killed. Now, what you want to tie into in terms of context is this violation of the great chain of being. Banquo is wondering why all of this is happening so quickly and he's wondering whether uh, Macbeth has deliberately violated his place in the great chain of being and he's now made himself king and he's done so wrongfully, okay? So of course, here we can see Banquo is quite critical. And of course, when you're talking about Banquo's character, you want to juxtapose how he is after he hears the witch's prophecies. He never develops ambition, never becomes corrupt. 
as opposed to Macbeth who becomes corrupt and he develops ambition. So that's really it when it comes to the five quotations to consider with Banquo's character. Thanks so much for listening.